Several years ago, Bronnie Ware, a nurse who worked in palliative care for 20 years, recorded what she perceived to be the top five regrets of the dying. They are as follows. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish that I had let myself be happier. I'm sure one or more of these resonated with you. The fifth regret always gets to me though, in part because it doesn't have such a clear answer like the others do. Changing the first four is self-evident, but then you get to number five and you think, well, here we are, convinced that one of our biggest priorities in life is our happiness. We pursue dreams and spiritual fulfillment, a sense of connection, love, and sex, a purpose in life, all with some belief that these things will make us happy. And yet, at the end of life, people feel like they could have let themselves be happier, like the idea never occurred to them along the way. You know, for a concept that humans deem one of the most important of all, it feels like we don't spend very much time talking about it. Maybe it's because, as writer and cultural critic Aldous Huxley lamented, there is something strangely boring about the happiness of other people. Indeed, most films end at the moment when everyone becomes happy. But even if you do manage to start talking about happiness, people bring up all sorts of objections. They say, well, by pursuing happiness, you never find it. There is, as we will find, a lot of merit to this view. Yet, never considering happiness also seems like an improbable strategy for becoming happier. Understanding what's important for happiness and what undermines it is beneficial. Another says, it's all subjective and relative. Happiness is different to different people and there are no universals. Again, there is certainly merit to this view, but the strict relativist is, I believe, mistaken to say there are no consensus ways for people to become happier. A third says happiness is for dumb or completely inauthentic people. Life is suffering and anyone telling you otherwise is full of it. We are born and then we die. What happens in between is brutish and cruel. These types seem proud of their inability to be happy. They've somehow gotten the idea that it's a demonstration of their sophistication. By refusing to see tranquility and joy in the world, they can never be wrong when things go bad. The happy man is a fool, they say. While happiness is not entirely a choice, I would argue that if you're capable of making changes, it's even more foolish to spend your life in a self-induced state of discontent. Happiness skeptics, who proudly proclaim they are just realists, are working from an impoverished view of happiness. The myth of a happy person not being able to see darkness or commit themselves to real problems in the world has somehow pervaded the popular imagination. It's time we get rid of it. A final says, happiness isn't everything. And to that I say, I agree. As we make our way through this series, we'll do our best to avoid fast hacks and the self-help aisle of the bookstore. I don't believe there are simple fixes for unhappiness or easy paths to bliss. So we're going to take our time. We're going from the philosophical to the physical to the psychological to the sociocultural. Happiness, like the everyday life of a human, is multifactorial. And if we want to come as close to the whole picture as possible, we need to address all of them. What are the meanings and mysteries of happiness? Can happiness ever last? I hope to explore these questions with you, and I hope your life is better for it. In the words of Jonathan Haidt, words of wisdom may wash over us every day, but they can do little for us unless we savor them, engage with them, question them, improve them, and connect them to our lives. Perhaps, in the end, we will find some coherence among this enigmatic subject. There is a tendency, in the United States at least, to equate happiness with pleasure in the moment, laying in the park with your significant other or drinking a cocktail on the beach. The other stereotype you often come across is that of the chipper, smiley person. You've probably seen them in a car commercial or making YouTube videos. If happiness is just transient feel-goods and cheeriness, then I'd suggest we're working with an impoverished definition of happiness. 
So it's important to get clear on what we mean by the word. People often say, well, it has too many meanings, or it's too vague, defining it as a useless task. Philosopher Immanuel Kant, for example, once observed, the concept of happiness is such an indeterminate one that even though everyone wishes to attain happiness, he can never say definitely and consistently what it is that he really wishes and wills. I agree with Kant to an extent. I don't think there is an easy master definition of happiness. I also believe, however, that over the past few thousand years of philosophy and century and a half of psychology, we've arrived at some pretty useful theories. The goal with them is not to say happiness is X, but rather, it's very pragmatic to think of happiness as X. I think all of them will help us escape the vast, murky ocean of daily chatter on happiness and bring us into clearer waters. But before we talk about them, we have one final distinction to make with this enigmatic word. Philosophers all the way back to Socrates and Buddha have talked about happiness in two different senses. One, a psychological state of being, or two, a life that goes well for the person leading it. The psychological state of being is just a descriptive term, like contentment. The latter, however, is evaluative, that is, it brings values into the picture. What does it mean for life to go well for a person leading it? What is good for them, and who determines what is valuable? Suppose, as philosopher John Rawls did, that a brilliant mathematician just wants to count blades of grass all day. He lives a pleasant life, but he never lives up to his potential. Would you say he's doing well? This is a question of values, not psychology. Recent scholars have therefore separated them into two different terms. Happiness, a psychological state of being, and well-being, a life that goes well for the person leading it. In this series, we will be talking about happiness in the psychological sense. An important note, we're just looking for a definition of what happiness is right now. We're not saying that happiness is being with good friends, or writing the next great American novel, or helping others in need, or eating chocolate. Those are potential sources of happiness. We're just looking for a working definition, and then we'll get to potential sources later. In short, life satisfaction is the state of being pleased that one's life is going well by one's standards. This is not the shrugging, yeah, my life is satisfactory, it's pretty good, could be worse. It's a wholehearted affirmation, a true endorsement of your life. The theory was developed by the father of happiness research, Ed Diener, and there are five questions, each that you can rate on a scale from one to seven. In most ways, my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I am satisfied with life. So far, I have gotten the important things I want in life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Add up the numbers and you hopefully get a robust measure of how happy you are. Life satisfaction theory is appealing for a few reasons. First, it takes into account people's values. The farmer who only cares about raising their family and plowing their fields may differ in values from the novel writing urbanite. That said, both can achieve their own version of satisfaction. Their happiness is connected to what matters to them. The second reason life satisfaction theory is appealing is that if people are wholeheartedly satisfied with their lives, their lives are probably going pretty well for them. But there are several problems with life satisfaction theory as a definition of happiness. The fundamental one is what philosopher Dan Habern calls cognitive affective divergence. That is, our judgments, our evaluations of our lives can diverge quite significantly from our affective state. A poet, for example, might be satisfied in their life of fighting against the man, but what if that entire time they were mentally tortured, anxious, and never in any kind of positive emotional state? Are they happy? How about a small town shop owner who lives an emotionally fulfilling life? She's secure with herself, has many close friends, is deeply engaged with her work, and experiences high amounts of joy and laughter. And yet, she's not satisfied because she imagines herself succeeding in the big city. Is she actually unhappy, or is she just not satisfied? Or how about philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who, on his deathbed, said, Tell them it was wonderful. By all historical accounts, Wittgenstein was one of the most miserable people on the planet. His closest friend 
described him as neurotic and sulky, and pretty much everyone at Cambridge knew he was chronically depressed. And yet, he had good reason to be satisfied with his life. He's considered by many to be the most important philosopher of the 20th century. A huge accomplishment. But was Wittgenstein happy? Not intuitively. This is where we run into problems. Life satisfaction theory, by its very nature, is retrospective, asking you to reflect on your whole life. Happiness, in the sense that we're looking for, is a psychological state of mind. It's not some intellectual endorsement that happens one moment and then is gone the next. To hammer this point home, Danny Kahneman, one of the world's foremost psychologists and researchers on happiness, separates the two. People actually want good memories. They want to be satisfied with their life. They're not thinking of the future in terms of experiences. They're thinking of the future in terms of anticipated memories. You know, if we could have both, then, you know, a happy life and good memories, that would be wonderful. But actually, it turns out in research on well-being that it's not the same thing. The conditions yeah. that make you happy in your life and the conditions that make you satisfied with your life, they are different. But the conditions that lead people to be satisfied with their life are much more conventional. They're about success. So, for example, money doesn't make you happy in the emotional sense, although poverty makes you unhappy. But money really doesn't buy you much happiness. But money buys you life satisfaction. The more you have and the more you earn, the more people are satisfied. What makes people satisfied is conventional success. And it just illustrates the tension between seeking happiness and, and seeking satisfaction. This is that cognitive affective divergence in a nutshell. It brings to mind the many people who pursue riches and fame, things that may bring great satisfaction, but end up miserable. It seems that life satisfaction is closer to a ego intellectual endorsement of life, and what we intuitively think of as happiness is an emotional endorsement of life. I'm of the personal belief, like Kahneman, that life satisfaction is more important than happiness, but uh, this won't be the last time we talk about it because this conflation happens a lot. Ah, good old hedonism. Hedonism argues that the most irreducible form of good is pleasure. Hedonists therefore define happiness as a positive balance of pleasant over unpleasant experience. As long as our pleasures outweigh our unpleasures, we are happy. There are many well-known thinkers under the hedonism umbrella, and all of them have nuances between them. The Cyrenaics, for example, saw sensual pleasures as the highest good. Epicureans were a bit more discerning, saying there are kinetic pleasures of satisfying a desire, like eating a pizza when you're hungry, and the catastomatic pleasures of tranquility, a mind free of disturbance, maybe like after eating a pizza. Utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham did not distinguish between types of pleasure and pain. He said what matters is their intensity and duration, and philosopher John Stuart Mill found that to be contemptible and tried to distinguish between higher and lower pleasures. All of that said, in modern discussions of happiness, psychologists approach hedonism in its most reductionist form, a positive balance of pleasure over pain. There are a few objections to be leveled at hedonism. The first one comes from me. I just had a pleasurable experience eating this cheesesteak. I don't feel happier. The second one comes from me. I've been trying to rebound from this terrible breakup by having tons of meaningless sex, but I've just ended up cold and unhappy. The problem here is that pleasure doesn't seem to reach deep enough. Philosopher Dan Habern points out, a hedonist can claim that experiencing pleasure has some impact on happiness, but in order to prove hedonism, they would have to show that happiness alters in step with pleasure. For a second critique, consider this thought experiment, the fictional case of Will. Will is very active and most of the time he is in a good mood, cheerful, smiling, and genuinely feeling good. He believes his life is going well and sincerely reports being satisfied with life. Yet, at the end of the day when he is alone and no longer occupied with activities, he breaks into tears. He's been like this for several months. Will's overall number of pleasant over unpleasant feelings, known as his hedonic balance, is on the positive side by a lot. But is Will happy? In Habern's own studies, people almost unanimously say he's very unhappy. Huh. You can be unhappy even though you feel pretty good most of the time. Why is that? 
Habern believes it's because happiness is a general psychological condition rather than a sequence of pleasurable experiences. And this brings us to our final theory. In its most basic form, emotional state theory says that to be happy is for one's emotional condition to be, on the whole, positive. This may sound kind of basic at first, but once we get into the details, I think you'll see it's quite nuanced. The philosopher of psychology who first proposed the theory, Dan Habron, starts by making a distinction between central and peripheral affective states. Central affective states tend to be phenomenally profound, pervasive, and lasting, with far-reaching effects on one's psychology and behavior. By contrast, one's mild annoyance at dropping a letter while bringing in the mail is superficial, focused, and short-lived. Its effects are limited. It is not central, but peripheral. To clarify this separation further, consider this excerpt from Stoic philosopher Epictetus. I have a headache. Well, do not say alas. I have an earache. Do not say alas. And I am not saying that it is not permissible to groan. Only, do not groan in the center of your being. The Stoics, like the Buddhists, did not expect us to never feel unpleasant sensations. Epictetus would never say, if hit in the face with a baseball, do not feel pain. The idea he expresses here is that we should not let it get to our core emotional being. Here, our happiness remains untouched. Even our language makes this distinction. We say something is getting to you, or bringing you down, or disturbing you. On the other hand, something might bounce right off you, or not phase you. An emotion shoots through your consciousness and is quickly forgotten. We also make the distinction when talking about depression. One is unhappy by virtue of being depressed, writes Habern, not by virtue of experiencing the unpleasantness of depression. Happiness has depth that pleasure theory misses. Consider the following graph from the well-known textbook Understanding Emotions. In between personality traits and moods is emotional disorders. Habern again. It is questionable whether emotional disorders belong in the chart or whether they form a single category of the right sort for this depiction. Should depression be lumped together with phobias? More worrisome is that the diagram recognizes no non-disordered emotional phenomena that are longer lasting than moods and yet less permanent than traits. What about non-disordered depression? Moreover, it supposes that moods sometimes last for months. This is implausible. Do particular moods often persist through sleep? Possibly, but one wonders whether psychologists have failed to distinguish a period in which a kind of mood predominates from one in which a single mood token persists, uninterrupted, for weeks or months. Habern suggests, therefore, that in about the same region occupied by emotional disorders, we add in emotional conditions. The additional category allows for negative conditions like depression, but also positive ones like happiness. So, so far happiness is an emotional condition. What is this emotional condition made up of? The sum of one's positive central affective states. Central affective states are moods and certain emotions that alter our entire emotional disposition. They have depth. They change, as Epictetus would say, the center of your being. On the other hand, many of these are peripheral affects. They do not alter our emotional disposition. This is strikingly similar to the Buddhist view of happiness. Listen to Matthew Ricard, considered one of the happiest people in the world, explain the Buddhist view. It's not just a mere pleasurable sensation. It is a deep sense of serenity and fulfillment, a state that actually pervades and underlies all emotional states and all the joys of sorrows that can come one's way. Well, you, that might be surprising. Can we have this kind of well-being while being sad? In a way, why not? Because we are speaking of a different level. Look at the waves coming near the shore. When you are at the bottom of the wave, you hit the bottom. You hit the solid rock. When you are surfing on the top, you are all elated. So you go from elation to depression. There's no depth. Now, if you look at the, the high sea, there might be beautiful, calm ocean like a mirror. There might be storms, but the depth of the ocean is still there, unchanged. So now how is that? It can only be a state of being. So let's nail down happiness as an emotional condition. What central affective states constitute happiness? There are three broad dimensions, endorsement, engagement, and attunement. Each one, as you'll see, plays a different role in our emotional lives.
And endorsement seems to get most of the attention in modern times, especially in the United States. It consists of affects along the joy-sadness axis and cheerfulness-irritability axis. Put simply, to be happy within the endorsement dimension is to be joyous and cheerful, not irritated or sad. One possible reason this dimension is seen as happiness in its entirety is that it's the most feeling aspect of happiness. You viscerally feel states of joy and cheer. It's also the most visible. You see smiles, frowns, and laughter. It's important to distinguish that within the endorsement dimension, some affects have greater depth than others. The profound joy of watching your child graduate is quite different from the mild joy of running into a good friend on the street or the elation of winning a sports bet. The other thing about endorsement affects is that they don't tend to last very long, and this can be dangerous if we consider endorsement true happiness. In the words of Habron, feeling happy is important, but we can easily get the impression that our happiness is just fixed at a set point that we always return to after a joyous occasion. According to emotional state theory, cheerfulness and joy are important states to feel, but if that's all you got, then it'd be very hard to deem you happy. The second dimension concerns, as you probably guessed, engagement with life. Not listless, bored, or withdrawn, but energetic, interested, engaged. You grab life by the horns and enthusiastically take on whatever it has to offer. Engagement has two ideals associated with it, the first being vitality, which is represented by the exuberance depression axis. I had a professor in college who was all the way on this side of the axis, full of zest at all times, even when we were talking about the most boring stuff. He came into the classroom and set it on fire with his presence. At the same time, he was my toughest professor and a very stern person. He rarely, if ever, laughed or even exhibited cheerfulness, but his positive and passionate energy in and outside of the classroom communicated to me a very happy man. Now, you may be thinking, but wait a second, a passionate life like that of a romantic poet or artist is a life of countless emotional disturbances. I agree, 100%. The Jack Kerouacs and Hunter S. Thompsons of the world are likely to experience a good amount of emotional turmoil. Emotional state theorists would say this form of extreme vitality is hard to achieve without compromising the other aspects of happiness. However, they would also say that you need not live life to the extreme. Vitality is possible without the instability and potential suffering that accompanies diving into darkness. Consider my professor, for example. The second ideal of engagement is flow, represented by a flow ennui axis. Ennui being the feeling of listlessness and dissatisfaction arising from a lack of occupation and excitement. And flow, well, you may well know the term flow. It has become quite famous since psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi proposed it years ago. Flow is what he calls a prime state of complete absorption in an activity. It occurs when there is an optimal balance between skill and challenge. Too much challenge for someone's skill and they get anxious. Too much skill for the challenge and people get bored. But when they match perfectly, especially with high skill meeting high challenge, someone becomes immersed in flow. Time and self-awareness seem to disintegrate, what athletes often call being in the zone. I get into it when I edit, others when they fly fish, and even others when they teach or have an engaging conversation. It's possible for many activities. People describe flow as a highly positive experience, and understandably so. It's more or less the opposite of boredom. So in the pursuit of happiness, vitality and flow should not be underestimated. The significance of engagement, writes Habern, becomes clearest in cases of depression, where the characteristic lethargy and listlessness signals a broad psychic disengagement from one's life. While sometimes disordered and always awful, this sort of withdrawal can sometimes be functional, facilitating major life changes by pulling us out of of our existing routines and signaling that our present way of living may not be worth continuing. I want you to recall the last time you were deeply settled and at peace with yourself. You had an inner, unmovable sureness. At the same time, your spirit was free and expansive. Was it with a particular friend that you hadn't seen in a while, or 
in a particular place where your internal and external world felt in harmony? This is attunement. There are three central affective axes within the attunement dimension, tranquility anxiety, confidence insecurity, and uncompression compression. It's not hard to see why attunement is the most important dimension of happiness. Its negative poles are the greatest sources of unhappiness. Disattunement is a state of alienation. A person is in circumstances that are unfamiliar, imposing, threatening. Defenses go up, anxiety, stress, insecurity. These states often rob us of the other dimensions of happiness. Feeling joy or vitality is much harder when you're anxious and insecure. However, on the positive side, you could say attunement more or less means a deep sense of being at home in one's life. In this way, it opens you up to experiencing the other dimensions with ease. Tranquility, in my mind, has always served as the foundation for happiness. A lot of people associate it with vacation, sitting on the beach and looking out onto the ocean or hanging out by a mountaintop lake. This is not quite the tranquility of the attunement dimension. Here, we're talking about the inner fortitude and peace of mind associated with Buddhist monks and the Stoics of old. Ancient thinkers, both East and West, had many names for this state of mind, and achieving it was considered by most to be the highest good. Unfortunately, many in the modern world conflate the shallower comfort with peace of mind. The distinction is important. One is a momentary remedy to pain, thought, and desire. The other is a mind free from those things. Notably, it is not an apathetic state, but rather one of contentment and compassion. The confidence insecurity axis no doubt has a close connection with the tranquility anxiety axis. Peace of mind requires a level of inner surety, a feeling of competence and self-respect. But this axis also includes somatic confidence, that is being at home in your body. Not on edge or nervous, but relaxed and graceful. It's the difference between someone who looks like one coherent organism and a person who looks like they're struggling to control alien appendages. And finally, the compression on compression axis. It is probably the most overlooked aspect of happiness. Compression includes stress, which quite literally compresses the spirit. One's mind narrows and their capacity for pleasure is smothered by concerns outside of the present. A stressed person walking down the street is blind to the small things in life, unlikely to look up at the stars. A compressed person is caught up in the rat race, confined and emotionally deflated. An uncompressed person, by contrast, feels free, expansive, spiritually enlarged. To the uncompressed person, her psychically compressed counterparts will seem like little people, worker bees or ants rather than full-sized human beings. Think uptight socialite versus unrestrained music festival regular, or an ever-busy 9-to-5-er -er versus this guy. It's important not to equate uncompression with exuberance. The Dalai Lama, for example, exudes a quiet uncompression. Other uncompressed people who come to mind are longtime hikers and ski bums. I do not think this is a coincidence. Society and culture can be huge sources of compression, and these types reside further outside of it than most. Indeed, Habern states that compression arises in any circumstance where we are not fully in control of our functioning. Consider the busy culture we live in, where overscheduling and micromanaging are the norm. Or perhaps a clearer example is the social pressure to conform, a constant sense that your identity is quite literally being compressed by outside forces. Other examples might include someone trapped in a bad relationship where they don't feel free to speak their mind, or a person who feels like they have to work in a certain industry because their parents expect it. Compression is the sleep of individuality. You can certainly live with compression for an entire lifetime, but it's not a desirable state at all. These are the three dimensions of happiness. Depending on who you are, you might value one over the other. However, I'd encourage you to see the synergy of all three as the strongest manifestation of happiness. I think Habern provides a compelling perspective for why. The prominence of attunement reflects what we may think of as the stages of flourishing for a creature. The first priority is to establish conditions of safety and security, where the basic needs for functioning are firmly established so that it can make itself at home and blossom like placing a sapling in fertile soil. The organism is in its element. It assumes a stance of attunement. This established, a stance of engagement will tend naturally to follow, as the creature exploits the situation in the energetic pursuit of its goals. Last comes the stance of endorsement, as the organism succeeds in meeting its goals. Now there's one final aspect of emotional state theory that's important.
In Haven's view, our happiness is not just made up of conscious emotional states. If, for example, you have a propensity to become easily irritated or depressed, then you're not actually happy. This is called your mood propensity. Recall the thought experiment we used in our argument against hedonism, the fictional case of Will. Will is very active, most of the time he's in a good mood, and he believes his life is going well. But at the end of the day, he breaks into tears. He's been like this for several months. His central affective state seemed pretty good, but is Will happy? No, in fact, he seems very unhappy. He appears to be suffering from some type of distress that bubbles up to his conscious mind. His unconscious propensity to fall into a terrible mood counts against his happiness. This mood propensity is more variable than trait, but psychologically deeper than any mood or emotion, and it varies with the circumstances of your life. Say, for example, you're mostly in a good mood, but have a regular propensity for anxiety because you're in a rocky relationship, or you're prone to burst into tears of grief having recently lost a parent, even though your daily activities and moods are positive. Mood propensities fly under the radar because they usually match up with the rest of our emotional condition. Happy people not only experience a lot of positive moods, but they're also more prone to experience them than others. When happy people experience unfortunate events, they appear less likely to fall into bad moods. And even if they do fall into a bad mood, they seem to bounce back quickly. But as you saw with Will, the propensity does not always match the rest of the emotional condition. There we have it, the full theory. Happiness is an emotional condition, which consists of three dimensions of central affective states and your mood propensity. To be happy is for one's emotional condition to be favorable on the whole. The big qualm with emotional state theory is that it hasn't been fully borne out by science. Habern himself admits that it's a rough and informal outline of a fuller view, with no pretensions at completeness or exactitude. He's well aware that some of his conjectures might uh, not survive further scientific study. As I said in the beginning, we want to have a clear idea of the happiness we want to pursue. You're welcome to choose any of the theories or any other definition that you have in your pursuit of happiness, but in this series we're going to use the emotional state theory. I think we settled that life satisfaction is important, perhaps for well-being, a life that goes well for somebody, but not the best definition of happiness, a psychological state of mind. I imagine there's still some hedonist holdouts out there, so let's clarify a few things. Hedonism is far better known than the emotional state theory. I think this is because emotional state theory is relatively new in comparison. A hedonist might even think, at first glance, that emotional state theory falls under pleasure and pain. This is understandable. Epicureans were considered hedonists, but they also valued ataraxia, or tranquility, and recent philosophers have gotten creative with their definitions of pleasure, like Derek Parfit, who defines pleasure as any mental state that is desired. Does this mean, then, that hedonism sucks emotional state theory up into its vacuum of pleasure and pain? Not quite. Emotional state theory excludes many pleasures from happiness. Peripheral affects, a prime example being the orgasm, are not constituents of happiness, yet may still be considered a desirable mental state. Another big difference is that for hedonists, happiness is for the string of your conscious experience to be pleasant. The emotional state view holds that your entire psychological disposition is a certain way. And finally, your mood propensity is not a conscious experience. Reducing it to pleasure and pain would require some serious mental gymnastics. Again, no issue with you choosing hedonism yourself, it's just not the theory we're using. I do think emotional state theory is the most useful way to think about happiness. Also, my intuition tells me that it encapsulates the other two theories. Hedonism and life satisfaction are potential sources of emotional state happiness. In the words of Habern, Think about those periods of your life when you were happiest. Good stretches of time wholly absorbed in something you love doing feeling fully yourself and in your element, energized, alive, and yet also deeply settled and at peace. No doubts, no fretting, no hesitation. And yes, feelings of joy here and there, perhaps a good dose of laughter. This is the emotional state theory of happiness.
In 2005, psychologists Barbara Fredrickson and Marcial Losada published a paper called Positive Affect and the Complex Dynamics of Human Flourishing. In it, they state that there's a tipping point where humans begin to flourish, a ratio of 2.9 to 1 positive over negative affect. Anyone below this ratio is, quote, languishing. This paper came under serious fire for its methodology, and after a large backlash, part of the paper was eventually retracted. To be frank, I don't think any mathematical model can keep track of the incredible complexities of happiness, nor do I think it's a particularly desirable approach. Hey man, are you on that 2.9 to 1 ratio this month? Yeah dude, my watch is telling me I'm happy. I mean, if we had to smack a number on where someone seems to be approaching a good level of happiness, 4 to 1 sounds good. But instead of going for complex equations, we can just look at the three dimensions and see the various combinations that result in stronger or weaker versions of happiness. If someone is experiencing a full sweep of the three dimensions far to the negative side, then they are truly unhappy, what Habern calls psychic rejection. A change is required. Their life is terrible. A sort of flatness, like I'm fine, would be if someone is experiencing a very mild form of all states. A negative level of attunement is likely to be an unhappy person. Without attunement, it's incredibly hard to succeed with the other two, even if you tried. Someone who doesn't feel at home in life cannot be saved by any amount of momentary cheer. On the other hand, if someone has a strong attunement dimension, they can probably weather any number of storms and stay relatively happy, even if they don't necessarily experience engagement and endorsement to a large extent. I like to call this hidden happiness. Such a person can be quite happy without showing its typical signs of joy, cheer, and exuberance. You're welcome to think of all different kinds of combinations, but the one that we want to focus on is psychic affirmation. When your emotional condition is favorable across all dimensions, with negative emotional states comprising a very minor part of the picture. If you're lucky, you might also experience psychic flourishing at some point in your life. Psychic flourishing is incredibly hard to achieve because it's essentially ramping up each dimension to the max, a perfect match between individual, environment, and context. What we might call happy and truly happy. One final addition. What about mood propensities? To put it simply, if your mood propensity tends to shift a lot and doesn't match up with your dimensions, your happiness is fragile. If it almost always matches up with your dimensions, your happiness is robust. And so we arrive at our final definition of happiness. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, said Mustafa Mond, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right then, said the savage defiantly. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have syphilis and cancer. The right to have too little to eat. The right to be lousy. The right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow. The right to catch typhoid. The right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence. I claim them all, said the savage at last. In 1974, philosopher Robert Nozick released his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. In it, he proposed his now famous thought experiment, the experience machine. Imagine that an experience machine has been invented. It allows you to spend your entire life safely plugged into a device and you can have any kind of experience you would like. They can be long, intense, or pleasurable, whatever you want, and they're completely indistinguishable from real ones. Play guitar like Hendrix, act like Meryl Streep, be Iron Man? Have a lifelong orgasm? You would not know you're plugged in and the machine never breaks. Would you do it? It immediately brings to mind The Matrix and Huxley's Brave New World with its drug Soma. Dystopias where humans are happy but not living up to their capacities at all. Well, it turns out that just like Neo, most people reject the simulation. According to Nozick, people actually want to earn their keep, to succeed, to achieve, to have an authentic human experience. We want to do certain things and not just have the experience of doing them. 
We want to be a certain way, to be a certain sort of person. Someone floating in a tank is an indeterminate blob. Is he courageous, kind, intelligent, witty, loving? It's not merely that it's difficult to tell. There's no way he is. Plugging into the machine is a kind of suicide. It limits us to a man-made reality. Philosophers have since tried to play with the wording of the Nozick experiment. They change a few details or add some contextual elements to make it more appealing, but it seems that no matter how they parse it, people reject the experience machine, even those in terrible life situations. Nozick's experiment subverts the idea that any type of psychological state of mind is the ultimate good. Many philosophers have therefore lowered the importance of happiness, making it a component of well-being in the great scheme of a good life. And I agree with this. One does not have to be happy to have a good life. It's how you handle what life throws at you that's important. Indeed, paradigms of the good life do not always bring to mind paradigms of the happy life. You don't have to agree with me on these, but a supportive and kind teacher who gets no recognition and has an emotionally flat life, but changes the lives of hundreds of kids for the better, had a good life. A mother who sacrificed all of her free time and emotional well-being to put her kids through school so they can have a better life, had a good life. On the other hand, we're usually disgusted at the idea of a person who leaves their spouse and children struggling to survive in order to obtain happiness for themselves. There are many historical examples too. Lincoln was far from happy and he's certainly a paradigm of the good life. MLK Jr.'s turbulent fight for justice probably didn't lead him to be as happy as this guy. Abigail Adams regularly wrote about how miserable she was, but she's one of the most important figures in American history. No doubt, morality is more important than happiness, and great suffering can result in great things. As the Greek proverb goes, a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they know they shall never sit. But it's also a bit cliche to say one must endure a lifetime of suffering in order to do worthwhile things. Experiments like Nozick's, I think, make happiness seem less important than it actually is. We don't live in a world where people lead a pleasant life of counting grass or plugged into an experience machine. Happiness is a substantial part of our well-being, and many moderns do not emotionally endorse their lives. When a way of life siphons a person's peace of mind, compresses them, leaves them half engaged with the world, and only has a few joyful moments, is that person really doing well? We all know people who chase some societal notion of success and would be better off happy. Instead of becoming a stressed and anxious lawyer, friends look upon them and say, she should have become a park ranger like she always talked about. She'd be just as fulfilled and much happier. And I think the emotional state theory of happiness might ease the mind of a 21st century moralist. This kind of happiness does not represent someone who is a bane to society. Sure, you'll get the occasional sociopath who is attuned, engaged in harm, and gets wicked joy from hurting others. But this person is rare. In all likelihood, this person is living a life of helping others. They're not anxious or insecure or compressed, so they can look outward. A level of moral integrity even seems like a possible candidate for peace of mind. Then, if someone is deeply engaged in their work and other interests, they're doing things that are meaningful to themselves and others. And if someone is endorsing their life, they probably have good relationships and notable successes. I think, as the series goes on, we'll find that happiness is not as selfish a pursuit as one might think. Selfish and unkind people don't tend to look like this, and they certainly aren't enjoying their lives like this guy is. The truth is, if someone is in a happy state of being, their entire disposition, and by extension, their entire life experience is colored by that fact. So the common idea that happiness is something we will acquire or find or achieve in some imagined future is a dangerous myth. In the words of Alan Watts, if happiness always depends on something expected in the future, we are chasing a will-o'-the-wisp that ever eludes our grasp, until the future and ourselves vanish into the abyss of death. If we do not consider the conditions of our lives that can be changed now, we might one day arrive on our deathbed with no future ahead and say, I wish I had let myself be happier. We can always progress towards some future we want, but if we do not flourish psychologically on our way there, we do not flourish at all. Thank you.